Let's talk to Helen Dale, writer, lawyer and political com commentator. Helen, a very good uh, morning to you. Welcome. Good morning, Mike. I know, I know we're not, we're not going to dwell on it, but give us a little flavour of what you think about what's going on in America right now. Well, I mean, I'll preface my comments by saying that I try to avoid paying attention to the United States <laughs> if I possibly can help it. Well, it's a bit difficult, which is isn't why it? I write about it. It's a bit difficult because I, but broadly speaking, I think that you've got this situation. One of the reasons why you've got this fervid atmosphere about the US election now in the UK um, is an obsession with a country that isn't our own. And that same obsession is what led to all the nonsense with the Black Lives Matter protests until it was finally pointed out by a large number of black Britons that the American history and the British history are completely different and completely irrelevant to each other. Um, so I, I think it's, I think we pay too much attention to the United States. And the thing that I'm afraid that does stand out to me um, is the dysfunctional way they run their elections and they can't appear to count the votes properly. A friend of mine made a rather unkind joke that they should just export the counting process to Sunderland <laughs> because Sunderland does yes. such a good job of Indeed. it every general well, election. Well, it does, I mean, there's an awful lot about American sort of... Um, um, infrastructure, which is very cumbersome indeed, and I think that's an ongoing problem for them. But let's leave it that alone. Is, yeah. Let's leave that alone and get to uh, the meat of the matter, which is what you wanted to talk about. You wrote, uh, or you, or you sent a piece out today uh, on Twitter uh, about law and oh, liberty. No, yes, yesterday it was published. It yeah. was, and interestingly, published by an American magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the one thing they do quite well in America is free speech, I have to say. I mean, yes, much better. They, they, do do. Much, they do it much better than we do, uh, and they do it much better than an awful lot of countries do. But but the piece refers to uh, the sort of genocide currently going on in China, which an awful lot of people don't want to talk about, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, some of the other things that go on in Europe that lots of people want to talk about. Tell us about it. Well, what I finished up doing was... I noticed, and I'm not alone in this, and I'm not a foreign policy person, but it was as plain as the nose on your face, uh, that you had all these Muslim countries complaining about Emmanuel Macron and the French government policy towards Islam, uh, towards the publication of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons, and so, uh, you know, riots and you know, diplomatic representations and so on and so forth. Uh, going on. And as far as I can establish, there has been one comment by Turkey about Chinese mm. treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang yeah. um, by, t in, by Turkey in the General Assembly of the United Nations the world's most ineffectual talking shop. Yes, indeed. You know, they haven't even called the ambassador in. Nobody else has said anything. And I wanted to get across to people because I, I grew up in Australia and there is an emphasis in Australia on learning more Asian history, Chinese and Japanese and Indonesian history. And I, I did the Chinese and Japanese and my high school school trip, you know, over here, they said, you go off to France, yeah. my high school school trip. And now this was in 1988 when I was in the lower six was to China. Wow. So it gives you an idea of the difference mm. in approach. Now, I wanted to get across to people, to Americans and to Brits when I wrote that piece, is that China, the reason the Muslim countries aren't complaining to China is because they're scared. Mm. And they know that the worst thing that the French will do to them is a vulgar hand signal, basically. Right. You know, Macron, very French, you know, rude cartoons and so on and so forth. Yeah. But they're not going to start destroying the economy of all the countries that have signed up to the Belt and Road program. Mm. They're not going to start killing people in large numbers or breaking up their community, which was which is the way China has responded to the Uyghurs. Yeah. And it's very worthwhile to just do a Google search or a DuckDuckGo search so you don't get weird search results and confine it to the BBC and go back to 2014 and see all the incidences of Islamist terrorism that was starting to happen in Xinjiang, but also they had a, a lorry a, a, a driving incident, not in Xinjiang, it was in Tiananmen Square, which is the, the main public square mm. in Piazza in, in Beijing. The one with the very famous temple with the picture of Chairman Mao on the 
on the wall. Yeah. Now, so they had some very serious ones. And you can see the commentary at the time in 2014 is very much, oh, China will just have to learn to deal with Islamist terrorism. It's going to happen there like it has in Western countries. And I remember seeing this at the time and thinking, the people who are saying this have no idea about China, right. Chinese history, and the, the attitude of Chinese intellectuals to monotheism. Right. That's the other thing, because they really do think it's a load of primitive nonsense. Mm. Um, they have a low opinion of it. Yes. And there are all sorts of reasons in Chinese history, including the Taiping Rebellion, which I can talk about, if you like, a little bit. Um, we probably for, haven't got time for that, Helen, today, I'm afraid. But let's, yeah. talk, let's talk about the transparency uh, of people criticising um, the whole cartoon business, the whole Charlie Hebdo business, because that uh, has seemingly set off for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, yet again, some terror attacks in France, and of course the one we saw in Vienna as well. Which, which although then, although then well. uh, they're not connected, perhaps they are sort of connected, aren't they? Well, you've got this this problem, and this is what Macron has been talking about, where you've just got failures of integration uh, across the European Union. Now, obviously, he's focusing on his own country, and he's been completely frank about it, and he's been talking about this for quite a long time. That you've got actual Islamists who perpetrate acts of violence, beheadings, bombings, shootings, whatever. But then you've got this ecosystem of Islamist organisations that may not be violent, but they excuse it. Mm. And that is what his government has started to go after in a pretty emphatic way. And they're getting, they're upset about it because, of course, you it's like the Charities Commission turning up and, and doing the equivalent to say muslim aid or christian aid over here saying you're interfering in a third country's electoral process or, or something like that mm. and taking away their ability to accept donations or to freezing their ability to engage in charitable sector work so think of it in those terms and what has made a lot of french people very angry is, and is the response from uh, la presse anglo-saxon uh, you know, the Ameri but particularly in America, to the way the French government is having to deal with this situation. Yeah. And they're not even treating it in as terrorism. And often the, the pieces, I mean, some of them have had to be removed. There was one that had to be taken down from the Financial Times. There was one that had to be taken down from Politico because they don't understand the most basic information about French government and French history and, and French Positive, the, yeah. the, the version of liberalism in France, which is laicite, secularity. And so, as far as the as far as the uh, the reactions from some of pe some of the people uh, in what you would regard as the mainstream Islamic uh, kind of communities of France and of other parts of the world, where they've been demonstrating outside French embassies, it seems extraordinary to me. More or less saying, you know, why are you shooting people who haven't been shooting anybody else? Yes, and, and I mean, and there was the dreadful incident where in Britain, outside the French embassy, the police allowed the French flag to be burnt. Yeah. Now, okay, there are arguments back and forth in America. Burning the US flag is, is part of freedom of speech. They've had litigation over it. It's been settled in the SCOTUS. But this is part of the thing of not understanding that France is a different country with, with different traditions and, and different beliefs. And I guarantee you, if there were people outside the embassy of the United Kingdom in, in France, the gendarmerie would stop the burning of the Union Jack, right. because that is just the difference in those, in, in those values. Mm. And that is an issue, I think, as well for the police in this country, um, who are under an awful lot of scrutiny and under an awful lot of pressure. And we have some sympathy with them in some situations. But when you see the police involved in taking uh, an old lady back to a care home, as we saw this morning on Julie Hartley Brewer's show, uh, against the wishes of her family, you do wonder quite what the police has become here. And, we're, and also particularly considering that the the woman in question was an, is a registered nurse, mm. works for the NHS, right. obviously knows how to do proper in-home care. Mm. Otherwise, you know, I mean, you, I do have sympathy for the police. I, I mean, I, I retweeted an account, an anonymous account by, by a police officer who had a, it was Francis Ha or Adam Wagner, one of the lawyers, mm. talking about all these silly lockdown rules. Yeah. And, he's, and he just went, oh, great, another month of unenforceable regulations, mm. which is the explanation for what you saw this morning when you were going to work. Yes. Uh, I mean, people have just decided, oh, 
bum, who cares? Right. Well, also, yeah. I think they've done more than that. I think what they've done is they've taken the view that whatever they did in springtime, which was uh, what many people thought was necessary, if they had to stop working and they weren't able to be compensated for that, they did it out of the goodness of their hearts and because they thought it would work. But now mm. those people, and they may be a relatively small percentage of the population, but people who need to physically go somewhere to do the work that makes them their money, they're not now yes. willing to stop doing that. No, they're just going to work. Yeah. So that's why you got to see a traffic jam this morning. Mm. Exactly. And why they're just traffic... going to work. But yes, go ahead. But let's finish up because we haven't got a great deal of time today, Helen, because we've got to listen to the Chancellor. So, I mean, in, ter <laughs> in terms of the, um, um, the, the juxtaposition uh, of what you're saying, um, even um, Islamic communities are reluctant and Islamic countries are reluctant to criticise China, but they're very willing to criticise any Western European nation for almost yes, and that the, most, uh, and the, the smallest infractions. Needs yeah, and that hypocrisy needs to be pointed out, and you need to be honest when you look at what Macron is doing and what, for example, the Australian government has done historically with dealing with Islamists and the piece that you tweet retweeted of mine goes into this, Yes, is that if Macron's method or the Australian method for dealing with Islamists, which are quite authoritarian but are still within a consistent liberal tradition, if those don't work, or if they're not allowed to work, then the Chinese approach starts becoming awfully attractive. Mm. And we need to be completely frank and look straight in the eye at exactly what China is doing there, why it is doing it, and a bit, be, having a bit of an awareness of Chinese history helps. But you don't want that to start looking like a good idea for mm. anyone. No. And I have a nasty feeling it is, and that's what alarms me. Yes. Well, Helen, it's a very interesting piece. I recommend people go and read it. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry we're slightly short cur curtailed today. We'll make up for it next week. Helen Dale there with a very thoughtful piece, which I've retweeted. Uh, you can find it on my Twitter feed, and you can find it on Helen Dale's as well, at Helen Dale.